Hey everybody, it's Jonah here. I just wanted to make a quick video. So I'm posting an interview that uh, my good friend Andrew Davis did with me last night. Um, and we talked about eschatology and he did it as an Instagram live. And so I spent the morning screen recording it so that I could post it here on YouTube because I felt like we covered a lot of really important subjects. And as many of you know, I love eschatology. Eschatology is my main study when it comes to theology. And I think it's very, very important for Christians to have a right understanding of eschatology. And so as you watch this interview, the audio is not the greatest, the quality is not the greatest, but I think the content is wonderful and I pray that it will be edifying to you. So enjoy and thanks for tuning in. I just want to talk end times, man. I just want to talk eschatology. Yeah. Um, I think we both grew up in that circle of pre-mill and know a decent amount about that side and um but i do think you see that hashtag eschatology matters and it does i think it, it adds so much hope it adds so much weight to what the finished work of the gospel um has what christ has bought and what is a part of that inheritance and pushing forward towards that end um that we have in christ so i would love to just kind of open it up and if you could man um just talk about where you stand, your journey with eschatology, um, and why you stand where you stand, and then kind of breaking down the different views. Sure, sure. So I started out as most people who live in Western culture typically do, and that is dispensational premillennialism, which I'll, I'll explain all the different um, terms uh, after I kind of go through the story. But that's kind of where I started. And I, I got a lot of that theology from like the Left Behind books and, and the movies and stuff like that, where th those kind of things just reinforced that view. It was taught in church. It was the accepted paradigm. And so, hey, that's what I believe. That's, that's, that all, that's all there is for eschatology was kind of the impression I was under. And I think a lot of people are under. Um, and so it wasn't until maybe a couple of years back that I actually had some people point out to me that, hey, the pre-tribulational rapture might not be found in scripture. And I kind of was just like, oh, that there's no way. There's no way. I've learned this my whole life. And so um, I started kind of looking into eschatology a bit more seriously and kind of gravitated from the dispensational view over to historic premillennialism, where I, I started to see less of a distinction between Israel and the church and a little bit more continuity within the, the whole of scripture. Uh, but still held on to that idea of the thousand year reign would be a future time when Christ, that, that Christ would establish after he comes again. Um, and so the, 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 the studies went on further and further, and eventually I ended up coming to Amel, a millennial position, um, and that, that changed things drastically in terms of how I saw everything, because in that position, right, you're seeing the millennial period as being the inner advental age between Christ's first and second comings. And so that changes everything. You believe Satan is bound. You believe that the nations are no longer deceived. Um, you believe that the millennium kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. Um, and this will probably come as a shock to you, but I've actually kind of moved from the Amil position over to post mill um, as of pretty recently. And the main reason for that is the Amil position, I love everything about it, and I, I would have called myself an optimistic amillennial for a very long time. And the the distinction that took me from the optimism of Amil to the post mill position was just the the verses within the gospel specifically, where Christ talks about all authority being given to him in heaven and on earth. Yeah. And now thy kingdom come in heaven on earth just as it is in heaven and seeing a lot of the old testament books and prophecies too kind of led me to the conclusion that yes the millennial kingdom is heavenly but there's an earthly manifestation of it as well through the the progression and i think that amillennialism leaves the the earthly authority of christ out in the sense of a progressive uh growth and so that's that's kind of an in a nutshell the the journey I went to is basically going through every single position um, until ending up at post mill. Um, but uh, to, to define those now, so dispensational premillennialism, we'll start there. So premillennialism in general is the idea that Christ is going to return 
after the tribulation period before the millennial kingdom and for those of you who are watching who don't know the millennial kingdom these views are based off of uh, revelation chapter 20 which talks about the thousand year reign of christ um, and it, to me it's kind of sad that the views are based off of that one chapter considering that there's so much of eschatology throughout mm -hmm. all of scripture that limiting your view to a title in that chapter is kind of sad but anyways so pre-mill basically means that they believe that christ is going to come before establishing this thousand year reign and this thousand year reign will be on earth where there will be a time of prosperity and peace um, in the land uh, satan will be bound from all activity and the distinction between a historic pre-mill and a um dispensational pre-mill is really the distinction between Israel and the church. That's probably the biggest distinction is the historic pre-mill would see continuity within scripture in terms of seeing Israel and the church as being basically one. The church is an extension of Israel. The Gentiles have been grafted into Israel and thus we inherit the promises of the millennial kingdom when that arrives the dispensationalist however puts a distinction between israel and the church and because of this they oftentimes believe in a pre-tribulational rapture as well and that's the idea that basically god put his plan for israel on pause we're now in the church age the, a parenthesis between his plan he's going to rapture the church out and then resume his plan for, for Israel in that seven year period of tribulation, which will culminate in his second coming in the millennial kingdom. And so that's kind of a brief summary of those positions. The amillennial position, um, ah, literally means no millennium. And so it's really not an accurate name for that position because they do, and I, I did for a long time. It is, there is a millennium. It's just the yeah. nature of it that's different. And so the idea is this is a position that holds that the millennium is a representation of the entire church age, only it's not on earth, it's in heaven. And it's the saints that have died and are reigning, currently reigning in glory with Christ in what most would refer to as the intermediate state. Satan is bound from deceiving the nations and um, very similar to post mill. And again, pre post, post millennials would basically believe that the second advent of Christ happens after the millennium. And we are, like Amel, are in the millennial period of Christ. Christ's kingdom is growing. Um, and so the main difference between the amillennial and the postmillennial is basically the Amel doesn't really see a manifestation of the kingdom on earth. They see that as being a heavenly millennial reign of Christ. The gospel is going forth and conquering, but not in the same way that a postmill would, where they would see not only is the gospel going forth and conquering, but it's also affecting political, social, economical structures. Um, and so a lot of post -mill millennials also end up being theonomists to a certain extent. Um, and uh, so that, that's a brief summary, um, but both the on mill and the post mill hold to the millennial period being before the second advent of Christ. The pre mill position holds that the millennial period comes after the first advent of Christ. There it is, bro. I was, <laughs> it's funny you say that because I find myself, you know, teetering back and forth. Obviously, I grew up pre mill. Yeah. Sensational. And um, the first engagement I had outside of that was Apology of Studios, Jeff Dervin, yes. Post Millennials. Yes. Um, and then I found what you were talking about. I read your article about kind of the Amil, optimistic Amil. Yes. And I, and, based on what you, I learned something new every day, praise God. So, um, and I, I was reading Isaiah 42 the other day and you see that idea of, of God's law reaching the coastlands, reaching the world. And I guess I'd fall in line. That's a post mill mindset. Yeah. Uh, that is a promise of God. And, and that's something that I would absolutely agree with and it's it's funny when you look at guys like bb warfield and you look at all these guys who were post mill the puritans and um you see how society changed when this was the forefront of eschatology right and i really do think man that the, the reason why all all this does matter is because people are where you put your faith and trust and where you place that hope it's in christ everyone agrees it's in christ he's already won the battle um but even it's 
easy for I think personally it's easy for complexity to to come in. You yes. are waiting to be raptured out of this for a loss of a better word, hellhole. Um, yeah. yeah. And it, it's just you look at the scripture and like uh, honestly when you look at Romans and you see Rome I think it's Romans four and you know, you see almost that reverse of when Christ died, the curse flips itself on his head. Right. One man died all you know, one man Adam sinned and all men died underneath. And then you see Jesus, one man obedience, flips it on his head. And we see like the sin trickle down through from Adam, but Christ's righteousness trickling out now into it's like a flip. And I, I read, um, I was reading, I read Post Millennialism by Keith Math- Matheson. And after I read that, I was heavily convinced. Um, by, by that, by what he was proposing. And then I read When the Man Comes Around by Doug Wilson. Yes. I, that recently. And, and the partial preterist view, just viewing those things historically, which we, I, I want to talk about that, man, because, yeah. because <laughs> we read Revelation and this culture it looks at Revelation and immediately places Antichrist in that book or immediately jumps everywhere instead of, they'll bring it to today or the future instead of let me read this like every other book or letter that or history document right. like i'm supposed to um you know how, why do you think that is and just how to approach that when you view books that deal with the end times yeah so I, I think i think a lot of it comes just from western culture we we like sensationalism i genuinely think that that's a huge draw of putting revelation into the future is we like sensationalism and the idea that the world is going to go down in not just an apocalypse but an apocalypse that literally has fantasy elements to it that's exciting for people to think about to a certain extent it's scary it's unpredictable um and so i think a lot of it comes from the sensationalism i think a lot of it comes from people that want to make money off of books too Mm. So they, they, they enjoy the fact that they know if they put a dispensational book that talks about, hey, hey, Hal Lindsey, for example, the rapture is going to happen in 1988. People buy that. They eat that up, you know, and then he postpones it to a little bit later. And you still see this happening today. And so I think the problem is we go into reading the Bible with the attitude that and this ties right into the whole uh, reformed theology. But we go into the Bible reading it from the perspective of. What is this for me? What, what, what am I getting out of this? What is this saying to me? Rather than looking, this is not a book about you. This is a book about God. This is about God's glory being exalted and manifested. And it was written in the first century to first century churches, specifically the book of Revelation. And like you were saying, we read the book of Galatians. We have no problem saying that was written to the Galatian church. It has application to us today, absolutely, but it was dealing with specific issues to that church. First, second Corinthians. Oh, yeah, that was written to them. But it has application to us. You get to Revelation and people say, yeah, no, those seven churches, it really didn't apply to them. It applies to us or, or the last generation alive. Um, and I think that one of the biggest problems is that it ignores the clear time indicators within the very first sentence of the book. These are things that are shortly to come to pass. These are things that are near. Um, and I like Gary DeMar says, short always means short and near always means near. You know, there's really no way around that language. And so when you read the book of Revelation, you have to read, and I, I, should, I should just say broadly, the Bible. When you read the Bible, your first question should be, what is the immediate context of this book? Who was it written to? What are the historical elements involved in, in, the, in history, what was going on in the area at the time, and understanding that. And there's a huge debate in terms of whether or not Revelation was written prior to 70 AD or after. And that's a, that's a big one to wrestle with for sure, because if it was before 70 AD, likely most of the prophecy dealt with the destruction of Jerusalem. If it was written after, then obviously it has a, a different application. I tend to lean more towards the pre-70 AD dating just because it, it just makes so much coherent sense through. But I also hold to a little bit more of an idealist perspective where it has ongoing application throughout church history um, in terms of the, the patterns, I guess you could say. Um, so I, I think when you approach the book of Revelation, when you approach the Bible, the question shouldn't be based off of books that you've read, movies that you've watched, 
it should be based off of what is the context, who was this written to, what is the historical period at this time, and allowing scripture to speak, not preconceived notions about what it should be saying. And also approaching apocalyptic literature, prophetic literature, uh, like the book of Revelation, we have to understand that the language that's used in that book is symbolic. It says in the very uh, beginning that the angel came and communicated these things to John. That word communicated really could, could be better translated as basically symbolized. To symbol, uh, spoke these things in symbols to John. And so when we read the book of Revelation, we need to take that into account. And so when people get to the book of Revelation and they read about scorpions, scorpion-tailed locusts that have the faces of men and hair like women and... They, they take that and they go, okay, I've heard some people say it's helicopters. I've heard some people actually, the Left Behind books portray them as actual locusts with faces and scorpion's tails. And you're just going, okay, <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we looking at this properly? If we're right. coming to that conclusion, are we, are, are we making a mistake here? And so I think um, and one of the mo most bib uh, biblical uh, hermeneutic principles is you interpret the unclear text in light of the clear text. <laughs> And so one of the main things, especially when you're going through the book of Revelation, is don't start with the book of Revelation. If you're yeah. new to eschatology, don't go into the book of Revelation to understand. Go to a passage like Matthew 24, which is a bit more clear, and that'll help shed some light into some of the imagery and the symbolism you see. And yes. also pay attention to the Old Testament and how it relates to the New Testament, because the book of Revelation is absolutely packed with Old Testament imagery and and even quotations and all sorts of stuff and so for example and then i'll i'll let you go where you want to go with this next but yeah, for yeah. example the lampstands are identified in the beginning as churches seven golden lampstands are, are the seven churches and the two witnesses are identified as lampstands and olive trees the olive tree ref reference comes from zechariah where it talks about um the, the, the priests and, and the, the temple and the olive, I mean, the lampstands refer to churches. And so this idea is they're described like Moses and Elijah, therefore they must be Moses and Elijah. And I go, well, let's look at the symbol, the symbols. And I think it would be better classified as this is the church. And it's a picture of the church or it's a picture of prophets. And through that picture, we can see a reality, something, the, the symbol always points to a reality, but the symbol itself is not the reality. And that needs to be understood when reading the book of Revelation. So I'll stop there for now. <laughs> oh, no. You could go all day, but um, yeah, it, it, it is crazy to me. Just not, I don't know why. And, and I wish that it wasn't just forced on you like that. Me, when I was growing up in the sense of, this is what it is, and the, especially in the pre mill Dispy arena. Like you said, man, it <laughs> you could be labeled a heretic. Yeah. But by some people, which is, no. yeah, which is unfortunate. And like I said in that funny skit, I said, man, let's actually look at church history. Let's look at what the what people held. Let's look at what all these things have biblical basis. Is sure. But I, I do want to know what the early church fathers believed. I want to. I want to know up until this point in time. You know, when did this start, and why is this a newer form of thought or whatever? Right. Um, and even really quick, even that, the the whole idea of studying church history, the premillennial position, because it's so prevalent right now, will push the idea that that was the predominant view throughout church history. That that's always been the main view. And when you go back and you study. The early church fathers, it was a mixed bag. There was yes. really no predominant view. And so that's why it's so important to go and study these things and not just believe what you're hearing without actually looking at it yourself. Amen, man. That's, that's great. Um, when you, earlier at the beginning of this chat, you mentioned that notion of Satan being bound. Yes. Um, can you expound upon that? Yes. So this is... <laughs> This is probably the hardest one for premillennials to, to grasp and to understand how on earth can you, and I, I've been, I've been in 
face-to-face conversations with people where they just go, you are insane to believe Saints bound. Have you looked out your window at the world? There's no way he's bound. And I, I, and, and yet this is also the, the part of my position that I cling to and hold to with so much assurance. And the reason for that is to define the binding of Satan. In Revelation chapter 20, it talks about an angel coming out, down out of heaven he seizes the great dragon, the serpent of old, Satan, who's called the devil, and he binds him for a thousand years. And mm. he binds him with a great chain and throws him into the bottomless pit. And the reason he's bound and, and what he's bound from doing is deceiving the nations. That's explicitly stated so that he could no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were ended. And so <clears throat> most premillennials, when they read that, they read chain bound, cast and sealed into the pit, that means bound from all activity. He, he's rendered completely, utterly powerless. And yet that overlooks the fact that the, the, the reason he's bound is that he can no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years was ended. And so, again, this goes back to interpreting symbols, right? There's no way a spiritual being can be bound with a physical chain or thrown in a physical pit and sealed in a physical pit. Satan's a spiritual being. And so we need to represent, we need to understand that those are representations of his restraint from the certain specific task of task of deceiving the nations. And when you go back to the gospels, it becomes very clear what this stopping him from deceiving the nations actually is. Christ says uh, when the Pharisees are accusing him of casting out demons in the name of Satan, He's, he basically tells them Satan's house would be divided if he was casting out demons. For I tell you, no one can enter and plunder the strong man's house unless he first binds the strong man. Mm. Then he can go and he can plunder his goods. And so most interpreters see that as a reference to Satan and Jesus basically saying, the fact that I'm casting out demons shows that I have bound a strong man and I can enter his house and I can plunder what he, what is his domain, basically. Um, another example would be Christ when he's talking in John, I wanna say it's John 13, I, I can't remember the exact reference, but he says, um, now the prince of this world is cast out. Now the prince of this world is cast out. And when I ascend, and if I'm taken up from this earth, I will draw all men unto myself. And so we see this picture that now the prince, the ruler of this world is being cast out and at Christ's ascension, he is now drawing all men unto himself. And so really what you're seeing is a picture of Satan being crushed, his authority to deceive being crushed and Christ receiving dominion, glory, power forever and ever in heaven and on earth, thus commissioning his disciples to go make disciples of all the nations. Why? Because they can no longer be deceived by Satan. Because yeah. he's bound. And so this is this is where we need to look. I can look out my window, like the premillennials say I'm not. I can look out my window and say, I see a lot of wickedness. It's it's no it's it's no problem for me to look out and say, Western society right now is crumbling. It's in moral decay. There is a lot of wickedness. We've got abortion, we've got racism, we've got so much stuff that is just totally, totally wicked. But there's one thing that Satan can't do, that I see evidence that he can't do, and that is he cannot keep the nations in darkness any longer. Mm -hmm. The gospel is going forth, the gospel is conquering, and he is bound from doing that. And so what do you think he's going to be doing? He's going to be waging war against the saints. He's going to be throwing deception wherever he can to stop the saints, and honestly, to get them to feel like they are defeated to get them mm. to feel that he is not bound. And Amen. so I think that this attitude of the world's ending, we need to get out of here, we need to wait for the rapture to pull us out, the world's going to crap, is a lie from the enemy to convince people that he actually still does have the power to deceive the nations when Amen. he does not. Amen, brother. And you mentioned a while ago, when you look at a broad view of the Bible. Yes. Start at Genesis, start at the promise to Abraham, you, you mentioned the nation being deceived. God told Abraham, as yeah. the of Israel, really, that, you know, those who bless you, I'll bless. Those who curse you, I'll curse. Yes. And see 
that even economically, I mean, archaeologically, we know in that time period, Israel is the center of the three major continents. The nations are coming to Israel. There's even, we yeah. see it in the Old Testament where, uh, I want to say it's in the Torah, where even foreigners can enter in and become Israelites. We see it in Second Chronicles where uh, foreigners are to come in and you are to make known to them the glory of God uh, so that they will come and worship him. And you see God's heart in that direction. Um, but you see it's still in this house of Israel, in the temple. Uh, yeah. And that's what I love about Ephesians 2 is Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. Uh, those of you who are near, uh, you know, and those of you who were once far off, a.k.a. Yeah. the nations, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Uh, and, and then you see that reality play out. with yes. under, and, and I think it's something to understand when Jesus gave the Great Commission to his, originally to the Jewish disciples, you know, James, John, and we have to understand, I think we, we should understand, I think like we, we, what, we, what we do with Revelation, we do with that passage a lot as well. We immediately say, let's go to all the nations, which we should. But in the immediate context, I think it's very interesting that Jesus is speaking to the Jewish people first. Right. And going to Jewish people in the, in the scattered nations. And that's why when you read Acts, when Peter is told to go to, to a Gentile they're not good. He's like, uh, he's hesitating. And notice three, he hesitates three times. Yeah. Uh, Peter in the number three, man. But um, yeah. <laughs> he hesitates because he's been given the Great Commission. But why not go into a Gentile? Because this mindset is in the Holy Spirit is showing him and, and he shows Cornelius. There's no more like Satan is bound, really. Right. Go to right. Gentiles. The Holy Spirit has fallen on the Gentiles and Peter is dumbfounded uh yeah. and the the lord it's almost like a paradigm shift in the sense of uh you are that you know the church you are the congregation of israel now and right. you are instead of everybody coming to you which was a foreign concept to these jewish disciples Every, like when jesus was saying i mean think like a hebrew when jesus was saying go to the nations uh let the nations know make know my name they were probably thinking all right Whoever's coming to us, like, boom. No, right. no, 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 we're going out. And Paul kind of comes on this on the scene as the apostle to the Gentiles, and he makes it even more clear. Uh, and I think, obviously, you see the pattern of, man, Satan is, like, the hope of the gospel is, is expounding. And then you see judgment on Israel, of course, in AD 70. But um, yeah. it's just, you look at the broad view. We need everything. We need yeah. everything. Um, right. And so crucial. You, you you take one pass at Revelation 20 in isolation, and, and it's over. Um, yeah. you, you cannot do that. Um, right. Okay. What is uh what what what's something else that really jumps out when you're talking with other people about just any eschatology, and they just whether it's a pre or any other position that uh, you kind of they'll butt heads with you. Like um, I'm thinking of like the. 70th week of Daniel, or like, what is what it's called? Yeah, the 70 weeks of Daniel. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm not as equipped in terms of the book of Daniel. That's still one that I'm working through right now. I'm actually yeah. through a massive commentary on it right now. But one of the biggest pushes, mostly from the dispensational side, is that basically the 69 weeks have, have taken place. But at the end of the 69th week, there was a pause. And that pause was when God basically put the prophetic clock on pause, stopped Israel, and turned his attention to start a new people, the church. And basically, when the church gets raptured, that final 70th week, which would be years, seven years, would basically take place then, um, at the end of history, once the church is raptured. And so there's this big parenthesis between the 69 and the 70th week. Um, from what I have studied, this comes from a misunderstanding of the 27th verse. And in the 27th verse, it talks about he establishing a covenant, a strong covenant with many for uh, one week. In the middle of the week, he will put an end to sacrifices and offerings. Um, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out upon the, the desolate, is basically how the verse goes. And so their belief is basically the he mentioned is the Antichrist at the end of time. 
and he is going to establish a covenant with the Jews, a peace treaty that will last seven years. In the middle of that seven years, he's going to um, basically dishonor the treaty, the peace treaty that he made, desecrate the temple, and then that seven years will end with, with Christ's return. And so the problem I see with that is there's really no scriptural warrant to put a gap there. And one of the arguments they make is there's other prophecies that seem to flow all as one, but had gaps in them. So why can't we do that with this? And the, re the main reason is the context. The context is Daniel is praying because he's anticipating that the 70 years of, of exile that, that the Jews were placed in under Jeremiah was coming to an end. And so God had promised, I think it was the Babylonian Empire, when they basically were crushed and defeated, that would be when the 70 years that Jeremiah had prophesied about would come to an end. And so this chapter, chapter 9 of Daniel, basically opens with Daniel praying and saying, Lord, I'm sensing the end of this 70-year exile. When will you reestablish Jerusalem? When will we be able to rebuild the temple? When will we have a resuscitation of our people? And so the angel comes directly as a command of God from hearing that prayer to tell Daniel this 70 week prophecy. And so to me, the context doesn't make any sense for the last verse to be some future antichrist, basically obliterating the Jewish people. This is all about the restoration of Jerusalem, the restoration of God's people, his chosen people, and ultimately about Messiah, about Christ. And so we see that the 70 weeks is decreed to make an atonement for sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to put an end to all, all to seal all the words and the prophecies and to anoint a most holy. That, that is the purpose of the 70 weeks. And as we go through, my, in, my best interpretation is that the he that is talked about in verse 27 is Christ. And that it's a recapitulation of verse 26. And actually, let me just pull this out so I can be accurate to the text here. But basically, um, where the dispensational will split up the text into 26 and 27 being separate, I would say 26 and 27 are a recapitulation of the same thing. Yeah. So in verse 26, it says, after the 62 weeks, which um, if we go back a little bit, it says that there will be seven weeks and then 62 weeks. And so put that together, that's 69 weeks. So after the 62 weeks, it's basically 69 weeks, which again shows me after the 62 weeks, well, what comes after 69? That would be 70. So there is no gap because this is taking place in the 70th week. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. And then it comes here. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And so basically what I think verse 27 is saying is that he, Jesus, will confirm the new covenant with many, with all the chosen, with all the elect. In the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Christ did. When he died on the cross, he was the final sacrifice and offering. There was no longer any sacrifice or offering in the eyes of God in the temple that was atoning for sins after that point. Christ brought an end to that. And then after that, on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. This would be referring to Vespasian and Titus in AD 70. That's the exact what I was thinking, man. <laughs> yeah. They come and they de destroy Jerusalem. And even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. The desolate would be Jerusalem. As Christ leaves the temple, he says, behold, I leave to you your house desolate as yeah. he leaves. And that starts right into Matthew chapter 24. And so what we're seeing here is that it's a recapitulation of verse 26 and the 70 weeks have been fulfilled. And it was a fulfillment of Daniel's hope for the restoration of his people. And this is the angel saying the Messiah will come. He is going to establish a new covenant. The old covenant is going to be completely wiped out and your people are going to be liberated into right relationship with God once for all through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ.
And so I don't see a need to put this in the future, the 70th week. I see it as having its fulfillment through the death of Jesus Christ and 70 AD as the culmination. Reminds me of Hebrews. <laughs> yes, very much. You know? Very much. Um, that's awesome, bro. You mentioned, I was actually going to go there, but you brought it up, Matthew 24. Yes. If you guys, you guys who are listening and you guys who have not, who will listen in the future, uh, if you haven't already, I want you guys to go look up Jonah Saller on his Instagram. He has a podcast that he does, the Jonah Saller Show. Um, but he went through a series on the Olivet Discourse uh, throughout the COVID period. Each Sunday, he would walk through uh, the passages in Matthew 24. And I it, I listen to every single one. That. Say what? I said I had a blast with that. Yeah, dude. Oh, my gosh. Guys, go and listen to those. Those are so enlightening. Um, but yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit. What were the, what were some of the key high points that, um, when it comes to that chapter, that maybe even the culture doesn't know or distorts, or that you really want that, that we should know and should hold. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I, I again, similar to um, Revelation, we need to read this through a first century understanding, and also look at the time indicators. What is the context and what are the time indicators? And the biggest time indicator is um, in verse 34 of Matthew chapter 24. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will be by no means pass away till all these things take place. Yeah. Oh, oh. This, this generation and yeah. the dispensational premillennial view and even some amillennials who believe that this t is also future, will say that this generation refers to the last generation that's alive whenever these things take place. Mm. And the reason that that is not true, the reason that that cannot be true, is number one, the Greek word used there, always refers to generation. And throughout all of the Gospels, and I, I could go back and count now, I'm not going to, but I challenge anybody listening, go back and read every single time that Christ says this generation he is always, without exception, referring to the generation that is alive with him right there. If he was talking about a future generation, he would have said that generation. And, and, not that, this. and, and just thinking, like, when, you, when you're thinking in that perspective and understanding what Matthew is doing in, what, in writing, uh, he's conveying the same thought here. And yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. So another thing. Looking at that and going, okay, this generation. Now, this is the problem I see a lot of people say. They'll say this generation, and they'll look and go, there's no way those things have already happened. Therefore, it cannot mean that. That's not how we read the Bible. It's not, it cannot mean that because I don't see it. It's, right. if this is what it says, I need to change my interpretation to accommodate the text. There's something wrong with me, not anything wrong with the scriptures. And Amen. so... If we go back to the very uh, beginning of chapter 24, Jesus has just finished giving an absolutely scathing rebuke to the Pharisees. Mm. He has called them a brood of vipers. He's called them hypocrites. He has said they outwardly appear righteous, but inside they are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And wow. he ends, he ends 23 by leaving the type, the temple and he says, see, your house is left to you desolate. Wow. And something very interesting is when he enters the temple, he says, my house will not be a house, uh, will be a house of prayer. Yeah. My house. And when he leaves, it's no longer my house. It's your house. Because the tabernacle of God, Christ, has left the temple. And the dwelling place is no longer there. And so that must be understood when getting into Matthew chapter 24. As soon as we go into 24, the disciples are pointing out the building of that standing temple. Not a different temple, not a third temple, that particular temple. Yeah. And Jesus says, do you not see these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone here shall be left in another that will not be thrown down. Right after that, they go up to the Mount of Olives. The disciples say, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And people want to say that the next thing refers to a future event. The context does not indicate that. The context indicates the disciples were asking about that temple, wondering when it was going to be destroyed, when this desolation would occur. 
what will be the sign of your coming? And I interpret this as you're coming either in judgment or into your mass messianic kingdom, because they were yeah. still anticipating Christ to be the messianic ruler of the world in the sense that most of the Hebrews did. Um, and then the end of the age, it can be interpreted either as the end of the world or the end of the Judaic age, which which I lean more towards that understanding yeah. um, based on the word age. Doug, sorry to interrupt, I think Doug Wilson does a fantastic job of breaking that Judean aeon and how yeah. that overlaps a little bit with the Christian aeon. And, right. and he does a fantastic job. Very much so. And so as Jesus starts this, and, and I won't go super deep right now, but he immediately starts answering his disciples. He's not talking to a bunch of different people in the future. He's talking to his disciples, and he says, see that no one deceives you. And from there, everything is related to you, referring to the disciples. See that you are not troubled. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then we get to the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, which again, I can go right back to where we just talked about. That's, that's exactly what Daniel was referring to as the destruction of the temple in AD 70, within that 70 weeks there. Um, it also had a, a mini fulfillment in Antiochus um, Epiphanes, who also desecrated uh, the temple um, in Daniel's day. Um, but as we go forward, the hardest part for people and this is the big one that I really want to want to get to is it says immediately after the tribulation of those days immediately and a lot of people who there, there's a lot of people who basically put verses 4 all the way through um, 25 as being relating to 70 AD but then after that it's not but when you get to that word immediately that implies immediately after this these things take place. This is not there's not a there's not a gap in time of two thousand plus years. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall for he from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So right there, a lot of people say oh, those things haven't happened. I haven't seen them happen. Those are that's apocalyptic language, and the Jesus is quoting directly from Isaiah 13 which talks about the destruction and the downfall of Babylon, where God is saying, I will come in judgment on Babylon. And the same exact imagery is used. The stars going out, the moon and the sun no longer giving them light, falling from heaven, same exact imagery. Not a literal thing, but symbolic of, of the end of, a, of an empire, basically, the end of a nation, the destruction and the judgment of a nation. And so right after that, it says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And I can guarantee you, people watching this, people who are watching my stuff, they're going to go, how does that not relate to the second coming of Jesus Christ? Yeah. It, it, it seems very clear. He's coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and then he sends angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They'll gather the elect from the four winds. How is that not the second coming? But what yeah. we need to understand again is we cannot look at this through the lens of a 21st century understanding. When Jesus says this, he is quoting Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel describes seeing one like a son of man coming on the clouds of glory, who comes into the throne room of the Ancient of Days and receives dominion, power, and kingdom. And so what Daniel is describing as a son of man coming on the clouds of glory is an ascension to power and to kingdom and to all authority and dominion. And so what you see here is Jesus is making the point to show his disciples, to describe to his disciples that when you see judgment on Jerusalem, when you see the temple and the animal sacrifices and everything obliterated through the Roman armies, you need to recognize that that's me. That's my power. That's me coming on my on the clouds into the kingdom and getting everything that Daniel prophesied about. Amen. And I mean, bro, when you just by no means is Josephus canon, but when you look at Josephus and what he said took place and you see his record of 
And, I mean, it's, it, it is agreed upon that Josephus in some areas maybe have over-exaggerated, but, like, he's trustworthy when you right, right. examine him um, on the on the core issues. But, I mean, he's saying things like uh, when the Roman armies were coming down and uh, there were groups of Jews leaving Jerusalem, pregnant women, all these people leaving and right. going to the mountains. And he didn't know really why, but there right. was of this of uh, uh they had that rumor they had that prophecy from christ himself they knew what to do when this right. was gonna happen and they escaped and right. you just see the same sentiment taking place jesus yeah. <laughs> it takes place and yeah and what's yeah. amazing too is is uh vespasian came and surrounded jerusalem but then somehow some way and this is recorded in history he didn't attack and he retreated Giving the Christians enough time to yeah. go to the mountains before then Titus came, and so it's amazing that that Christ gave this example, and then the Roman armies actually retreated for the Christians to do that, which you can see again God's provision in hand, right there. And so the last thing He will send His angels with the sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Can't remember the exact passage, but the trumpet does not necessarily require you to think of the same trumpet that's being blown at the rapture passage that is popular in in first thessalonians that's the last trumpet but trumpet is typically a sound of of triumph of yeah. gathering together your armies to gathering together your people right. um, like a, so that's the imagery that that is being taken from the old testament and then angels can be translated as messengers amen awesome and so what we see here really is basically the end of Matthew's gospel. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go make disciples of all the nations. This is Christ saying, I am coming on the clouds of glory into my kingdom. Jerusalem's destruction, the end of the old covenant is showing you that I do possess all power glory and I will send out all my messengers onto the earth to fulfill the great commission. And so, if you notice, right after that, assuredly I say to you, all these things will take place within this generation. And everything did exactly the way Christ said. Yeah. You look at, uh, going back to Josephus, all these things that Jesus said would happen before judgment upon the temple, destruction of the temple, they did happen. You look at uh, the earthquakes, famines, all these, the, uh, uh, the famine that took place with Paul in the early church of Jerusalem. Paul was trying to break that and of course there were earthquakes that were recorded in other um, documents of antiquity up in Asia Minor around the world the Mediterranean I mean all these things did take place um, yeah. and right in front of us it's right in front of us like you said I think that you cannot if you are a Christian when you approach the scripture for you guys listening and to those who will when you see something you're like oh that can't be that is if you can't have that mindset um, you can't say, oh, that can't be. That doesn't make sense to me. Right. Well, no, you should conform to that. If something doesn't, it, it, you know, even the most controversial issues when it comes to, you know, you hear all the time, for example, do you believe predestination? Uh, what do you mean? It's in the Bible, my friend. That kind of mindset, it's right there in plain sight. I need to conform to that. Sure, there's other things you can talk about in that, but um at the end of the day, conforming yourself to that. And, and this applies not just to the doctrines of justification and sanctification. It applies yeah. to theology. It, it applies to the study of what our Lord said would happen, guys. So as you're studying the scripture, um, just keep that in mind. Conform to the text, exegete. And I think that's important, guys. Um, two scholarly words, exegete and eisegete. Exegete, God means... You are pulling what is in the text out. Eisegete, you are imposing your own opinions, thoughts, and presuppositions onto the text. You don't want to do the latter. You want to do the former. Exegete, that's what you must do. You are called to do that as a Christian. Um, so, yeah, we'll be up around an hour, man. If you have any closing thoughts, man, what are those when it comes to how to approach studying the end times? Yeah, so just really quick, I just saw a comment that's really important. So his ascension was the desolation of Jerusalem. No, his ascension 
happened before the desolation of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was the sign of the Son of Man in heaven that is mentioned in that verse. That was the sign to the disciples that he, where he was and the authority that he had. Um, but yeah, to get to closing, um, one verse that is the most quoted verse from the Old Testament and the New Testament is the verse that says, for he must reign until he has made all his enemies a footstool. It comes from the Psalms. The psalmist writes, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I have made all your enemies a footstool for your feet. And so my closing statement would be this. Peter quotes it. Paul quotes it. The book of Hebrews quotes it. It is littered throughout the New Testament. The common eschatology system is that as history progresses, the enemies of Jesus Christ will become more and more and less and less submissive to him until his coming. And he's going to have to come and subdue everything all at once because things are getting so bad. But when you read that verse and you read it in scripture, the context is that at Christ's ascension, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, as Hebrews 10 tells us, he has been waiting until all his enemies will be made a footstool for his feet. The last enemy to be defeated is death. And so we, as Christians, regardless of whether you're a premillennial, an amillennial, or a postmillennial, we should have an optimistic outlook on the trajectory of the church, the trajectory of the gospel, recognizing that all authority is in Christ, all authority in heaven and on earth, and the gospel will be fulfilled. The peoples will be converted. The nations will be one to Christ and all his enemies will fall in submission to him. And when that happens, he will return and defeat the last enemy, death, and all will be made right once again. That's the mindset we should all have. Amen, brother. And that is, I mean, we, we look to, we do look to 1 Thessalonians 4, and that's called the rapture passage. But what is at the end of that section... Paul tells the church at Thessalonica, encourage one another with these words. This yes. is hopeful. This is victory. This is, um, as, as many, Doug Wilson would say it like this, and many other post mill guys, you know, all these things have been bought, purchased, accomplished. They are just being fully realized as we are living. And we are. Think, yeah, think about it this way. We are being sanctified. Yes. So why are we not thinking that creation is also being sanctified. Yeah. There's a disconnect there. God yeah. is Lord over me, and I'm a new creation in Christ. But then we look at this world, we need to recognize it's a new creation in Christ as well, and it's progressively being sanctified towards the day of redemption, just like we are. Amen. Christ reconciling all things to himself. Brother, thank you so much. If we could, Jonah, if you could just end it in a word of prayer. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just we come before you so grateful lord that you are king that you are on the throne that you are reigning lord i can't i can't picture a greater reality than looking at the evil and wickedness and depravity around us and not even flinching because we know that we have a conquering king who's not conquered who's not conquering in the future but who has already conquered Lord, we, we are so grateful that we have the scriptures to study a topic like eschatology. And Lord, I know it can be a divisive subject, but I pray, Lord, for unity. I pray that whether people are premillennial, amillennial, or postmillennial, that we can all unify on the central hope that we have, and that is the hope of the gospel. That is the hope that through Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to you. And so, Lord, we all, like Paul, Look with eager anticipation for the redemption of all things. We groan with creation right now, longing for the redemption. And we thank you and we praise you for who you are and what you've done. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen, brother. John, it's been a pleasure. God Likewise, bless. man. Always good.